Nowadays, the best-selling car of all time is the uber-exciting Toyota Corolla. However, roll back into the early 70s and Volkswagen, they were throwing a party because they had just surpassed the Ford Model T with their Beetle as the then best-selling car of all time. So knowing that, riddle me this. What Volkswagen that's not a Beetle and not a Golf sold over 2.5 million cars worldwide? One could rightly refer to this as the Zenith, the Volkswagen Squareback or Type 3 production. Being a 73, it's the last year they built these things. And it ushers in a number of changes. And no, it's not the startup procedure. Uh, that is reminiscent of modern day cars circa 15 years ago. And notice, it starts right up and that's not because it's warm outside or because I've already been driving it. It's fuel injected, more on that later. But the big changes, the safety stuff like we saw in that Pagoda. Notice a three-point harness from the factory, uh, rubberized dash from the factory, rubberized knobs. Even the window winders are plastic and rubberized. Uh, enough of the Ralph Nader stuff. Let's get down to business. Yes, the Type 3 was a significant departure in terms of design for Volkswagen. However, the engine, that really was a different story. You see, it was very much based on the flat four that came out of the Type 1, the Beetle. Uh, but to put it in this car, they had to make a number of changes. The biggest being was the packaging. If you've ever seen the flat four in the Beetle, it has a fan that sits on top of it. So it makes a very flat engine look tall. Uh, here they repositioned the fan so they could package it into the Type 3, and that earned it not one but two nicknames, either the suitcase engine or the pancake engine. Then the other big change they made is they marketed it as the most powerful engine that Volkswagen had made to date. And that's because, what, the Beetle was just under 1.2 liters? Uh, this, when it came out in late 61, early 62, was 1.5 liters. Then they made some major changes in 1968. Uh, they bumped it out again to 1.6 liters, but more importantly, that car was fuel injected. Remember the 300 SL Gullwing episode? Uh, that car was the first production car to have fuel injection from the factory. This was the first volume production car to have fuel injection from the factory. Now even with that, still not a lot of output. 52 horsepower, yes I said 52, and the torque, 86.2 pound-feet of torque. Uh, that fire-breathing amount of pushing power, remember this is rear-wheel drive, went through one of two transmissions, either a four-speed manual, which this is, or a three-speed automatic. And how do I put this? The three-speed automatic was terrible. Hopefully, I have not been unclear. Now, even with all of this, and only a 10.2-gallon tank, this car back in 1973 turned 26 MPG. Hopefully, you are comfortable, because this going to take a while. That's the tabs completely open. Uh, this is not so much a question of power delivery and really not a question of speed. Uh, it will top out with a manual transmission 84 miles an hour. The big question as we're climbing up in second gear here is what is the 060? Um, before I tell you, as a basis of comparison, like a modern day car, like a Golf or a Camry, that's about seven and a half to eight seconds. This, 18 seconds. 18. The Type 3 was introduced back in 1961. However, it wasn't until late 61, early 62 that they were put in production at the Wolfsburg factory. And there they took a lot of learning from the Beetle. Biggest example was how the bodies were mounted to the chassis and the floor pans. However, they did have their own technology. Uh, one example of that was the rear end of the car. The engine, the transmission, and the rear suspension all mounted to a rear subframe. And then, of course, there were three different body styles. There was the notchback, which never officially came to the U.S. Very attractive, though. This station wagon, which I love. They called it a squareback in the U.S., a variant in Germany. 
And then there was a fastback, also called a TL. But it wasn't until 1966 that Volkswagen officially imported the fastback and the station wagon to the U.S. And then, uh, starting with the 1600s, they offered a model called a 1600A, which was like a basic model with less stuff in it, if you could believe that. They only offered that in the U.S. for one year only in 1973, and they called that the basic. The ride quality in this thing is pretty good. Now, granted, it's a huge function of you really can't get in trouble with that little amount of horsepower back there. But it's also a function of some of the suspension bits. It's better than you'd expect from, really, this thing was designed, what, 61? Uh, it's not agricultural. Uh, it is independent all the way around. Torsion bar all the way around. There's even an anti-roll bar in the front. So you can actually go around a corner at speeds that are manageable for this, and they're really, you don't feel a lot of pitch, you don't feel terrible ride quality, and now by the numbers, this thing, it should not ride as well as it does, because it's short, it's really short. 94.5 inch wheelbase, as a basis of comparison, like a golf wagon, I, I would argue that's the replacement to this, that's a full 10 inches longer wheelbase than this. And then everybody now buys crossovers, so like a Tiguan, a Rogue, those are like 12 inches longer in wheelbase. Yet this, there's a composure to the ride that you, you normally wouldn't get in a classic car. Nobody would accuse me of being a Volkswagen fanatic, yet by starting with the building block of a small flat engine mounted in the rear, this was a marvel of package engineering, especially considering from the 60s into the early 70s, what they did here was allow for more storage room in the back, which allowed for more packaging room of people in the middle of the car, which allowed for more room in the ubiquitous Volkswagen frunk. But then in 1970, they lengthened the nose of the car by 4.5 inches, which allowed for more room in the frunk, enough to package a full-size spare tire and a jack. Now, the news in 1970 wasn't all good, that's when we got the cow catcher bumpers. But this, the surgery didn't go as bad on this as say some of the domestics. Like you look at some of the pony cars from like what, 72 to 75, they, they lost any beauty they had. This, not as attractive as like 71 and older, but it still has the design ethos from the early 60s. Brakes, they're a bit of a surprise here in their usability, like here's an example. Uh, ready? Notice there's no like pageantry. The SN does not pick up and put itself in a different place, which usually happens with drums in the back as this has. Uh, but that's a huge function of this is Volkswagen engineering. And another huge piece, this thing only weighs 2,166 pounds. Yes, it is indeed that time again to play our newest game options, Game Senior. That's the game where we go through the prices of the classic cars when they were new, if that information is still available, and compare them to what they're worth today, according to our good friend Dave Kinney, who literally writes the book on classic car values. And before we start here, I do want to point something out. This is the most affordable car we have yet to feature on this game. Uh, so with that, 1973 Volkswagen Type 3, otherwise known as a squareback in the US or variant in Deutschland, $2,749 base price. Now, there were some factory options that could be fitted to these cars. Leatherette upholstery, yes, vinyl, you paid extra for, and then a very, very rare factory option, a sliding metal sunroof. I can't honestly tell you what the real price with those options were, but a fully loaded car was about 3,000, so let's just go with the $2,749. In 2020 dollars, that equates to $16,621. Now, if you think about the car that replaced this, it was the Dasher, so that means the Passat wagon would be the real spiritual replacement of this thing. They don't sell that in the US, they sell the Golf All Track. That $27,000, I don't know if they sell it one anymore, but anyway, it was $27,000 just last year. So 16 grand is quite a discount compared to what they're selling for today. Now we press on to the most important part of this game. What does Dave say it's worth? This was a difficult exercise because I had just gotten Dave's newest book. And while there are a lot of entries for Volkswagens, there are no entries for a squareback. So I literally had to get him on the horn 
and we went through this together, he actually did a couple days of research and came back with some really interesting numbers. Uh, for example, the color, it does stand out, this bright orange color. These, they had a lot of period colors that were available, but he found a full 30% of them that came to the U.S. with either white or beige, and that does impact the value. Uh, and he did find that there is just a wide spectrum of these things. Like a car that doesn't run, you can get that for a couple of grand. But a running car in probably condition four, that was $9,000. He says you could probably get a good one for anywhere between twelve and eighteen thousand dollars. Probably not orange. Probably not with a sunroof. This car is just above a two condition, and this one is anywhere between high twenties, low thirties, with the bright orange, with the manual transmission, with the factory sunroof. Now these, they were not rare. Uh, they mostly were made in Germany. They did make a bunch of them in Brazil. They look a little bit different, but for our exercise, let's focus on the German worldwide production. Uh, the notchback or the fastback, they made 1.3 million of them. And the variant or the squareback, they made 1.2. So here's a car that's about as rare as glass, but still pretty cool. And then the most fascinating thing he pointed out to me was the bumpers. If you were to look at like the Corvette world, specifically early C3s, early C3s are worth more not just because of the engine, they're worth more because they have prettier, smaller bumpers. That's not the case here. Uh, 71 and prior, they had smaller bumpers, but according to Dave, it does not change the value of the car. Yes, it can get pretty toasty in here, and no, you can't hit automatic climate control, but there are a couple of things you can do. Uh, wind down windows, and then there are these vent windows in the front. Uh, and then there is a system, it's actually down here. Uh, it's cold is down here, hot is up here, and then the defroster, meaning to put the air on the windscreen, you put this down, but if you want it on your feet, you pull this up, and then this controls the vent, or really how much air is coming out of the vents here and down there. Now, there was an air conditioning system that was optional. It was very similar to the systems we've seen in classic Mercedes from the 60s and the 70s. It sat underneath the dashboard, took up some of the knee room, uh, and basically it was literally like a wall unit you have in a New York City apartment. Unlike other cars you and I have driven in this Retro Drive Review series, the first and second owners of these things there was definitely a type. Like, you talk to Dave Kinney, he'll tell you they were generally university professors, aging hippies with young families, and rugged individualists. As you got into, like, the second owners, a lot of the DIY crowd. But now that it's a bona fide classic, it still has a type. In fact, multiple types. Now, this car has something special fitted to it from the factory, and that is the sunroof. It is a metal sliding sunroof that you gotta crank like in the olden days. And I kinda love that, it's very reassuring. Wow, it doesn't sound good when you do it. But when you get it cranked, you really do get some ventilation in the car, better than opening up the windows, or definitely better than the fan down there. Let's focus on the history of this specific car, Citroen 436. It's special for a couple reasons. Number one, super low miles, 33,000 original miles from new. Number two, unlike all the other cars you and I have driven in retro drive review episodes, this one is owned by the manufacturer. Volkswagen Group of America, they've got a collection of cars based in Herndon, Virginia, that they rotate around the country. So I got this car directly from the manufacturer. Now you would think, because the manufacturer owns it, they either owned it from new or they restored it, considering the condition. Uh, neither is true. Turns out this car was sold originally to a guy named Eric in Gaithersburg, Maryland back in 1973. I can tell you that because this is the original owner's manual. It's still in the glove box. And then invariably, it found its way to the Pacific Northwest, Portland, Oregon. Back in the day, this was kind of like having a Subaru. And it lived a good life there. So much so that a Volkswagen employee saw this car for sale on the street. I was like, you know what, we need a squareback for our collection. So they had a Volkswagen expert uh, look at the car over in Oregon. It's like, hey man, it's a completely straight car. So what they did is they redid the chrome, they touched up some of the paint, and they redid the upholstery in the interior. And then on top of all that, this car has very unique rally history, a squareback. Uh, this did the debut, or really premier, Chattanooga Motor Car Festival rally last year. And in that rally, it was driven by yours truly. 